Chapter 13 Generation of Abraham Begin all acts and thinking by using El Kalum the All. Tablet 14 Solomon and Makeda 19 times 11 equals 209. Lo, the great ruler Solomon was thought to be the wisest man in the world, even wiser than all the animals and all the fish and insects called the wisest of wise. He knew the secrets of the sun, moon and stars. He knew the secret in people's hearts and he knew how to speak with the animals. Now at this time, there lived the lonely Makeda far away in Sabean. Those who don't know, say in the region presently known as Yemen. Those who do know, know that she came from Ethiopia. There lived a mighty ruler in the land called Sheba. Makeda was the most beautiful woman in the whole world. She too was known for her great wisdom. But as a wise person, wanted to grow wiser still. One day she called her astrologers and learned men before her and asked, what do you know of this man called Solomon? Is it true that he is the wisest of the wise? They answered, Wise is he, wise he may be, but none can be found as wise as you. Yet the lonely Makeda still wanted to seek for herself. She put together a huge caravan saying, I will go to the ends of the earth to share wisdom. So the lovely Makeda set out on her long journey at the head of a splendid caravan. Her servants carried rich gifts of spices with frankincense and myrrh, jewels and gold. Drums rolled and trumpets rang out as Solomon bid a royal welcome to the lovely Makeda. He led her along the path of gold and silver to a great feast in her honour. At shadow hour, they walked in the garden of Solomon's golden palace. Tell me, he asked, why have you come so far? I want to learn from the wisest man in the world. Are you that man? asked the lovely Makeda. See for yourself, Solomon said. Test me. Then tell me, said the lovely Makeda, what runs day in shadow hour, but never gets tired. A river, answered Solomon. The lovely Makeda nodded and asked another riddle. I have a basket of diamonds. Every evening I scatter them, and every morning I gather them up. What am I? You are the sky, and the diamonds are your star, Solomon answered. Have I passed your tests? So far, the lovely Makeda said, but I have one more. Her last test took a long time to prepare. The lovely Makeda had a hundred artists make a thousand flowers out of paper, silk and glass. She filled the flowers with sweet smells and planted them in a palace room. Then, without telling anyone, the lovely Makeda hid one real flower in the room. My garden holds a secret, she told Solomon. Can you find the one real flower hidden amongst all the rest? Of course, said Solomon. He looked and looked. He sniffed and sniffed. Each flower was lovelier than the last, but only one was real, and even Solomon could not pick it from the rest. His nose grew weary, his eyes grew blurry, and still he had to search. At last, he stopped and mopped his brow. I am warm from such hard work, said Solomon. He threw open a window and let a cool breeze blow in, and he smiled to himself as a little bee buzzed in. Solomon bowed to welcome the tiny creature. The lovely Makeda puzzled as she watched Solomon. He whispered to the bee, find the real rose for me. Then the little bee buzzed from flower to flower. It did not rest till it found a small red rose in a faraway corner of the room. Solomon watched carefully. The little bee settled on the rose and sipped its nectar. Thank you, bee, said Solomon, and let it sip its fill. Solomon then plucked the rose and gave it to the lovely Makeda. The lovely Makeda thanked him. You are indeed wise, yet the bee helped you. She has the right knowledge to know where to be and the right understanding to help the wise. Your wisdom is as great as the greatest Israelites, yet there are many lands with great men with great knowledge, wisdom and understanding the world over. Israelites are just one. Drums rolled and trumpets sang out when the time came for the lovely Makeda to return to the great and noble land of Ethiopia. Solomon gave her parting gifts and wrote great poems in her honour, for he had fell in love with this most beautiful Ethiopian Kushite ruler. But the lovely Makeda prized one small red rose above all the other riches. She planted its seed in her garden and forever after its sweet smell and golden nectar spoke of the secret that she had learned and shared, that the wise, even small creatures can be great teachers. This great Kushite ruler Makeda was from a noble line, the Kushite compromise of two languages and geographical groups, the Amhara and the Tigri. The Tigri inhabited the northern part of Kush, their language Tigrinya is related to Giz, the ancient and church language of Kush. The Amhara inhabited the vast areas of what are today, the provinces of Begenda Godjam, Wallow and Shoa, which covers the rest of the country. The language Amharic is the official language of Kush with English being the second language. 
Haile Selassie was not one of the bloodline of Judah, he was of the seed of Benjamin by way of his son Rosh. The word Rosh, which means its head, is also derivative of the word Ras, as in Rastafari. Ross was one of the sons of Benjamin and Hilda. Benjamin had nine daughters, of one of which was Makeda, who had sex with Solomon and gave birth to Menelik. When she heard about Solomon, Makeda sent 500 male servants and 500 female servants, 500 bricks of gold, a crown with set jewels, a musk ambergris, and other things by a messenger with a letter. She said that if he is really a ruler, then he will accept the gifts, and if he is a prophet, then he will not accept the gifts. Then she decided to go to Jerusalem and meet Solomon. Solomon. She left Beersheba with 12,000 rulers, each ruler having with him thousands of people. When she arrived in Jerusalem, she asked Solomon questions that no one in her kingdom could answer to test his knowledge against hers, and Solomon was able to answer them. And it came when Solomon then married the lovely and beautiful Makeda, but reinstated her as Queen of Saba and spent three days in every month with her. On one of his progresses from Jerusalem to Mareb, he passed through a valley inhabited by Shaggies, which, however, dressed and lived like men, and had a more comfortable dwellings than the other Shaggies, and even bore all kinds of weapons. He descended from his flying carpet and marched into the valley with a few of his troops. The Shaggies hurried together to drive him back, but one of their elders, Lard, stepped forward and said, Let us rather seek safety and submission, for our foe is a holy prophet. Three Shaggies were immediately chosen as ambassadors called monks to negotiate with Solomon, and they are Sinbad, Shukum and Harin. He received them kindly and inquired to which class of Shaggies they belonged and how it came to pass that they were so skilled in all human arts. They said they were taught by the Duanis of the underworld. The ambassadors replied, Be not astonished at us, for we are descended from men, and they are the remnant of Enkidu, the friend of Gilgamesh's community, which notwithstanding all admonition, continued to desecrate the Sabbath until El Yehua cursed them and turned them into apes. Solomon was moved to compassion and to protect them from all further animosity on the part of man, gave them a parchment in which he secured to them forever the undisturbed possession of this valley. At this time, there came a division of troops into this valley, but when they would have raised their tents to occupy it, there came an aged ape, Allah, with a scroll of parchment in his hands and presented it to the leader of the soldiers. Yet, as no one was able to read it, they sent it to Zadok, to whom it was explained by a shaggy, who had been converted to Islam. He set it back forthwith and commanded the troops to evacuate the valley. Meanwhile, Makeda soon found a dangerous rival in Gerada, the daughter of the ruler Nabara, who governed one of the finest islands in the Indian Ocean. This ruler was a fearful tyrant and forced all his subjects to worship him as a deity. As soon as Solomon heard of it, he marched against him with as many troops as his largest carpet could contain, conquered the island and slew the ruler with his own hand. When he was on the point of leaving the place of Nabara, there stepped before him a virgin who far surpassed in beauty and grace the whole harem of Solomon. Not even Makeda accepted her. He commanded her to be led to his carpet, and threatening her with death, forced her to accept his faith in his hand. But Gerarda saw in Solomon only the murder of her father, and replied to his caresses with sighs and tears. Solomon hoped that time would heal her wounds and reconcile her to her fate. But when, at the expiration of a whole year, her heart still remained closed against love and joy, he overwhelmed her with reproaches and inquired to how he might massage her grief. As it is not in your power, replied Gerarda, to recall my father to life, Send a few genie to my home, let them bring his statue and lace it in my chamber. Perhaps the very sight of his image will procure me some consolation. Solomon was weak enough to comply to her request and to defile his palace with the image of a man who had defiled himself and to whom even Gerarda secretly paid divine honours. This idol worship had lasted forty days when Asaph was informed of it. He therefore mounted the rostrum and before the whole assembled people pronounced the discourse in which he described the pure and devoted life of all the prophets from Adam until David. In passing to Solomon, he praised the wisdom and piety of the first seven years of his reign, but regretted that in his latter courses showed less of the true fear of El and El. El. As soon as Solomon had learnt the contents of this discourse, he summoned Asaph and inquired of him whereby he had deserved to be thus censored before the whole people. Asaph replied, You have have permitted your passion to blind you and suffered idolatry in your palace. Solomon hastened to the apartments of Gerard 
Father, whom he found prostrate in prayer before the image of her father, and exclaiming, We belong unto Allah, and shall one day return to him. He shivered the idol into pieces, and punished the princess. He then put on new robes, which none but pure virgins had touched, strewed ashes on his head, went into the desert and employed Elian Elian El for forgiveness. Elian Elian now pardoned his sin, but he was to atone for it during forty days. On returning home in the evening, having given his signet ring into the keeping of one of his wives until he should return from an unclean place, Shakar assumed his form and obtained from her the ring. Soon after, Solomon himself claimed it, but he was laughed at and derided for the light of the prophecy had departed from him, so that no one had recognized him as the ruler, and he was driven from his palace as a deceiver and impostor. He now wandered up and down the country country, and wherever he gave his name he was mocked as a madman, and shamefully entreated. In this manner he lived thirty-nine days, sometimes begging, sometimes living on herbs. On the fortieth day he entered into the service of a fisherman, who promised him as his daily wages two fishes, one of which he hoped to exchange for bread. But on that day the power of Shakar had come to an end, for this wicked spirit had, notwithstanding his external resemblance to Solomon, and his possession of the signet ring, by which he had obtained power over spirits men and animals, excited suspicion by his ungodly deportment and senseless and unlawful ordinances. The elders of Israel came daily to Asaph, preferring new charges against the king, but Asaph constantly found the doors of the palace closed to him. But when finally, on the fortieth day, even the wives of Solomon came and complained that the ruler no longer observed any of the prescribed rules of purification, Asaph accompanied by some of the doctors of the law who were treading aloud in the Thorah forced his way, spite the gaze of the keepers and sentinels who would have hindered him into the hall estate where Shakar sojourned. No sooner did he hear the word of God which had been revealed to Moses than he shrunk back into his native form and flew to haste to the shore of the sea where the signet ring dropped from him by the province of the Adonai of the universe. The ring was caught up and swallowed by a fish which was soon afterwards driven into the net of the fisherman whom Solomon received this fish as the wages of his labour and when he ate it in the evening he found his ring. Then he commanded the winds to take him back to Jerusalem, where he assembled all around him all the chiefs of men, birds, beasts, and spirits. He related to them all that had befallen him during the last forty days, and how Elian and Elian El had in a miraculous manner restored the ring which Shakar had wildly usurped. He then caused Shakar to be pursued, and forced him into a copper flask, which he sealed with his signet, and flung between two rocks into the Sea of Tiberias, where he must remain until the day of resurrection. The government of Solomon which after its occurrence lasted ten years, was not clouded again by misfortune. Gerarda, the cause of his calamity, was never desired to be seen again, although she was now truly converted. But Makeda, he visited regularly every month until the day of her death. When she died, he caused her remains to be taken to the city of Tadmor, which he had founded, and buried her there. But her grave remained unknown until the reign of Caliph Walid, when in consequence of long continuous rains, the walls of Tadmor fell in, and a stone coffin was discovered sixty cubits long and forty cubits wide, bearing this unique inscription. Here is the grave of Makeda, the queen of Saba, and consort of the prophet Solomon, the son of David. She was converted to the true faith in the thirteenth year of Solomon's ascension to the throne, and married him in the fourteenth, and died on Monday, the second day of Rabbi Awal in the twenty-third year of his reign. The son of the caliph caused the lid of the coffin to be raised up and discovered a female form, which was as fresh and well preserved as if it had just been buried. He immediately made a report of it to his father, inquiring what should be done with the coffin. Walid commanded that it should be left in the place where it was found, and be so built up with marble stones that it should never be desecrated again by human hands. This command was obeyed, and notwithstanding the many devastations and changes which the city of Tadmor and her walls have suffered, no traces have been found to the tomb of Makeda. A few months after the death of the ruler of Saba, the angel of death Israel, son of Anu and Eid, appeared unto Solomon with six faces, one to the right and one to the left, one in front and one behind, one above his head and one below it. The ruler, who had never seen him in this form, was startled and inquired what this sixfold visage signified. 
With the face to the right, replied the angel of death, to fetch the souls from the east, with that to the left, the souls from the west, with that above, the souls of the inhabitants of heaven, with that below, the demons from the depth of the earth, with that behind, the souls of the people of Majudi and Jajudi, Gog and Magog, but with that in front, those are the faithful, to whom also your soul belongs. Must then even the angels die? All that lives becomes the prey of death. As soon as is Raphael, son of Bathiel and Shufiel, shall have blown the trumpet the second time, then I shall put to death even Nusku and Murdoch, and immediately after that must myself die, at the command of Eli and Eli and El. Then the Inunakai alone remains and exclaims, Whose is the world? But there shall be no living creature to be left to answer him, and for Forty years must elapse, when his Raphael shall be recalled to life, and that he may blow his trumpet a third time, to wake all the dead. And who among men shall rise first from the grave? Yeshua the Messiah, who shall in later times spring from the seed of David. It's Raphael himself and Nusku, together with other Anunnaki, shall come and cry, You purest and noblest of soul, return again to your macular body, and revive it again. Then shall also the other prophets grave and shake the dust from their head. Then Nusku greets them, and points to the winged Barax, who stands prepared for them, and to a standard and a crown, which Elian Elianel sends them. Come to your Adonai and mine. Those you elect among the creatures in the Garden of Eden are festively adorned. For you, the hour is awaiting you with impatience. He then lifts them upon Barak, places the heavenly standard in their hand, and the crown upon their head, and leads them into paradise. Thereupon, the rest of the Enoshites shall be called back to life, they shall all be brought to Gadash, where the great tribunal shall be held, and where no intercession is accepted. That will be a fearful day, when everyone shall only think of himself. Adam will cry, O oh Adonai, save my soul, only I care not for how I Eve, nor for Abel. Utnafishtim will exclaim, O oh Adonai, preserve me from hell, and do with Ham and Shem as you please. Abram shall say, I pray neither for Yishmael nor Yitzhak, Sork, but for my own safety only. Even Moses shall forget his brother Aaron, and Yeshua his mother. So greatly shall they be concerned for themselves. Eli and Eli and El shall implore the mercy of all, for all the faithful. They that are risen will then be conducted over the bridge, which is composed of seven bridges, each of which is a thousand years long. This bridge is as sharp as a sword, and as fine as a hair. One third of it is an ascent, one third of it is even, and one third of it is a descent. He alone who passes all these bridges with success can be admitted into paradise. The unbelievers fall into hell from the first bridge, the prayerless. From the second, the uncharitable. From the third, whoever has eaten in the month of fasting. From the fourth, whoever has neglected the pilgrimage. From the fifth, whoever has not commended the good. From the sixth, those who indulge in evil, and whoso has not prevented evil from the seventh. When shall the resurrection be? That is known only to Eli and Eli and El, but assuredly not before the advent of the last, Malachi. The last previously to him, Al-Mahdi, before him Muhammad, and before him the prophet Yahshua sprung from your own family, shall preach the true faith, shall be lifted up by Eli and Eli and El and be born again. The sun shall rise in the west, and many other signs and wonders shall proceed. The pamphlets of peace shall be everywhere, and he will restore the true way. Suffer me to live until the completion of my temple, for at my death the jinn and the luciferians will cause their labour. Your hourglass has run out, and it is not in my power to prolong your life another second. Then follow me to my crystal hall. The Anunnaki of deaf Israel accompanied Solomon unto the hall, whose walls were entirely of crystal. There Solomon prayed, and leaning upon his staff, requested the angel to take his soul in that position. The angel consented, and his death was thus concealed from the demons a whole year, till the temple was finished. It was not until the staff, when destroyed by worms, broke down with him, that his death was observed by the spirits, who in order to revenge themselves, concealed all kinds of magical books under his throne, so that many believers thought Solomon had been a sorcerer, but he was a pure and divine prophet. When the ruler was lying on the ground, the angels carried him together with his signet ring to a cave, where they shall guard him until the day of the resurrection.